All right, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Uh, come on in and find a seat this morning. And uh, this morning is a little bit different for an Equipping Hour. And uh, you have just entered the living room of the Pagel home. And uh, we have a round table here, uh, which is indicative of the round table discussions that have happened around their dining room for decades. And uh, we get to have a little bit of that this morning. So um, this is an opportunity just to uh, interview uh, Barb and Denny, and we get to hear uh, how the grace of the gospel invaded their lives, and then the transformation that ensued. And um, we're going to pick their brains a little bit on some parenting things too. So why don't I pray for us, and we'll get started this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. We are debtors every day to your kindness. We thank you that you save. We thank you that your gospel is powerful. Uh, we pray this morning as we reflect on your grace uh, in the lives of, of Barb and Denny, uh, we ask that you would be glorified in it as we reflect on your grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. We are so thankful uh, that your grace just does not forgive and leave us alone, but forgives and transforms. Um, and we thank you so much for the, the, the work of grace in their lives uh, that has redounded to, to many of our lives in this room. So we just pray that uh, as we think about your goodness to us, that you'd be honored, um, that our words here would be clear and helpful in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a, a little bit of uh, behind the scenes, why I've wanted to interview Denny and Barb for some time is as Janet and I moved here, we, we came here with three very young ones. And our arms were full. We added a couple more to the mix. And they gave us all kinds of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and we felt, frankly, helpless. Um, and, and we needed help. We needed help uh, that came in a timely way. And, and so uh, regular for us was this hotline to the Pagel home. What do we do when? Yeah, but what if she is? And what if he etc., um, when it came to parenting ours. And so uh, they've been a tremendous help for us. They've been a tremendous help for many in this body as it relates to parenting. Um, and more than just parenting, uh, we love your story. So uh, I'm just going to start. This is going to be interview format. I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, if you don't answer satisfactorily, I'm going to start getting into really hairy theological conundrum questions. This was not disclosed. Up front, and I man. might ask you states and capitals. So, be on your best behavior. There's a rule in counseling. When we don't agree with something, we get to stand up. So if you see us stand up, we disagree with the question. Okay, that's the or we signal. We won't, won't answer the question. Fair. All right, uh, let's just start. Uh, Denny and Barb, tell us how you met. Barb and I worked for a lending institution that had several branch offices, and I worked uh, in the uh, Iowa branch, and Barb worked in the Nebraska branch, and uh, one Friday afternoon, the, uh, our company had a little gathering after work, and uh, we were fortunate to be able to attend that, and we ended up sitting together and uh, spent uh, a good share of the rest of the evening together. That's where our relationship started. Barb, you wanna add anything to that? No. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's add to the story a little bit. Tell us how you met the Lord. Well, I grew up on a uh, farm in South Dakota, and it was actually my grandmother's farm. My uh, grandfather left the family when my dad was 13, and he took over. And so he basically just learned how to farm and work hard and uh, we had no spiritual upbringing uh, we rarely attended church and so we didn't ever hear anything that was close to the gospel I was the oldest of uh, four children and uh, really began working on the farm when I was eight years old we milked cows morning and night my dad didn't go to high school because he took over the farm and uh, so he believed that uh, what was good for him was good for me. And so he, he and I were kind of at odds about uh, me going to high school. 
And uh, one day, the, uh, uh, one of the local teachers, ag teachers, stopped by and recruited me to uh, go to or attend his classes. And my dad was there, and, and uh, he listened, and uh, I think that was a convincing moment that uh, he says, okay, well, maybe high school's okay. We got a driver, a, a, a student school permit so that I could come home right after school because dad said, those cows are gonna be waiting for you no matter what time you get here. <laughs> so, um, but work was the center of everything. Uh, we learned to work hard and really that kept, uh, kept me out of trouble. Um, but my parents did give me lots of freedom as long as my work was done. And uh, that freedom was not always the best thing for me. Uh, in high school, uh, I had several leadership positions and uh, was pretty good at sports, and so I was kind of considered a, a big man on campus, so to speak. So anyway, a uh, <laughs> little big man. <laughs> That's the way it's always been, so. <laughs> uh, but that transpired into, transpired into a, a prideful outlook on my part, and I thought, pretty highly of myself, and I didn't think that I could do too many things wrong. So um, I was in several dating relationships, was married uh, in 1970, graduated from college in 1971, uh, but then divorced in 1974. Married again in 1977 and divorced in 1979. So apparently I didn't know too much about marriage. So anyway. Uh, as you can guess, there was very little, ex uh, we were, uh, I was exposed to very little uh, spiritual um, experience. Um, and uh, in 1980, I moved to Sioux City, Iowa, and began a new job there in the uh, lending institution that uh, where Barb and I met. Um, and uh, we uh, um, worked in different branches, and that's where I met Barb. And so I'll let her take it from here. Our, our testimony is kind of four parts. So uh, I, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska. So it's a little step up from South Dakota. And uh, <laughs> I make sure he knows that. I grew up in a Catholic home, very um, devout. Well, my mom was very devout. My dad was kind of Catholic, I think, in name only. I was the fourth born of six kids, so I had the title of the oldest of the youngest. Uh, we had a fairly normal childhood. My mom was a great mom, and my dad always provided for us. Our parents did the best that they could, but they were definitely outnumbered, and they weren't believers, so they knew nothing of God's word or how to parent us biblically or even really at all, and their parenting was eclectic at best. You know, try this, see if it works, try that. So after putting most of their energy into parenting the older three, they kind of decided to take more of a hands-off approach for the younger three. Uh, and they actually told us they were going to do that. But it gave us a lot more leniency. It gave us uh, a lot more independence. And so unfortunately for me, that didn't pan out so well because I became very rebellious and just sinfully independent. And before long, I just kind of became my own authority. And nobody could tell me what to do, not my parents, my teachers, not my future bosses, and certainly not my future husband. Um, any authority in my life at that point uh, was a joke. Uh, and I thrived on conflict. I felt entitled to whatever I wanted. And if I couldn't have what I wanted, I fought until I got it. And this led to, uh, very early on, um, stealing and drinking and drugs and just partying with friends day in, day out. And honestly, even my ungodly friends got tired of me. <laughs> they really did. Throughout all this, I would still attend church every Sunday, go to Mass, and I thought after being out all night, God must be so proud of me for coming. All the while growing up, I never, ever questioned God. I never questioned whether there was a God. Um, I always believed in God, but I had never heard about having a relationship with his son. We were taught that he died on the cross, for our sins, but I didn't know exactly what that meant. I didn't know my sins separated me from a holy God and that I needed to be rescued from God's wrath. I had never heard Romans 3.23 or 6.23 that all fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. 
I had never heard of repentance, that I needed to be born again. I had never heard that there was a free gift of God, which was eternal life, or that we were saved by grace through Christ alone. None of that was taught to us. In fact, what we were taught was just the opposite, that we had to be good enough, do good works in order to be accepted by God. The problem was no one told us how good was good enough. And looking back on my life, and every time I do my testimony, I, I do this quite often, is that you would think that I might question my standard of good enough, but I didn't. And in my natural thinking, only really bad people went to hell. Um, I would have never, ever considered myself a child of the devil, as it says in 1 John 3, but that's exactly what I was. I was oblivious to my sin. I had no idea um, even what it was. Um, so because I didn't know the bad news, um, that there was no one good enough um, in order to be accepted by God, uh, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection just really did not mean that much to me. So by the time I was 21, I was pretty set in my ways. And I think a better way to say that was that I was a brat. <laughs> I was mean-spirited. I was prideful. I was very hard-hearted. And I was deceived and enslaved to my sin. And I was in no way uh, ready for a relationship with anyone. I was a mess. And you know what's worse than that? <laughs> I loved my mess. I loved my messy life, my carefree party all day, party all night life. And then along comes Denny. He was the branch manager in the Iowa branch, like he said, and he was a great boss. Everybody talked about Denny. Um, my bosses couldn't say enough about him, and neither could the girls in the office. The <laughs> <laughs> the you didn't tell me you were going to do that, Denny. <laughs> The, the men and women who worked for Denny, they just had a, a great deal of respect for him. And I always say that Denny was so different from any guy that I'd ever been around because he actually had a job. <laughs> <laughs> and he was mature and very focused and really future-minded. Um, and I was not. Um, we were, just say we were just the complete opposite of each other. And when we began dating, uh, even my family felt sorry for Denny. I'm not kidding. They said it. They voiced it to me. Um, they knew something he didn't know. Within a couple months, Denny took a new job in Omaha, Nebraska, and asked if I wanted to go with him. Our relationship, after two months, was already shaky at this point. And once we moved to Omaha, we began the descent downward. It just literally plummeted. And there, all of a sudden, uh, there's this person that I'm supposed to answer to in my life, and I fought it all the way. I began to resent him for so many reasons. It, actually, for every reason I could possibly think of, I began to resent him. And I became so bitter because he took me away from all my friends and my partying, and I just wanted my old life back. Um, for the next year and a half, uh, we barely tolerated each other. In fact, we hardly saw each other because Denny traveled from Monday to Friday, so I just continued on as usual with my friends every night. One day I remember thinking that Denny was acting a little stranger than usual. <laughs> and I, which is, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I, I was so afraid, so afraid that he was going to ask me to marry him. And he did. I can't remember saying yes to his proposal. But she didn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say no. Uh, well, I don't know. But uh, when, I, <laughs> when I got home that night, I was so down. I don't think I've ever been so down as I was that night. I could not believe that I was going to walk down the aisle and become Mrs. Denny Pagel. I literally shivered at the thought. And the next morning when I don't think anything could get much worse. He asked me for, we, we should really pick a date for our wedding. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, I'm still grieving the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> now we got to pick a date. Oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. Is May 1st on a Saturday? And he looks and he goes, yeah. And I go, that, isn't that like SOS, like help? Like, help me? D isn't that what that means? He goes, yeah. And I go, May Day, May Day? He said, yeah. I said, well, that's a great day for our wedding, don't you think? trying to pick a fight, and he's like, okay, May 1st it is. I was on a roll. <laughs> so, yeah, so the day of our wedding, 
Well, up until our wedding, honestly, it, it, it got worse. Our fights became more intense, and we tried counselors. We tried everything. Everybody told us not to get married, and I'm like, you think? Um, but anyway, our wedding, my mom came in, was helping me put my veil on, and she said, Barbie, why are you marrying him? And not because she didn't like Denny. She absolutely loved Denny. I think she was trying to protect him. Um, but our honeymoon was a disaster. Our marriage seemed like it was over before it even began. Um, a lot of people have asked me, why would you marry him if you despised him so much? And I honestly say, I don't know, other than the grace of God, just God but God. Several years into our marriage, I found out I was pregnant with our first son, Matt, and I didn't tell Denny for weeks because I knew he'd be happy, and I didn't want to make him happy. Um, so I just kept it in until he left for a two-week business trip. And I told him the night before he left, I just felt so trapped now because we're bringing a child into this relationship now. And uh, Matt was born, and he just became the love of my life. Um, and then two and a half years later, we had Sam, and then Mickey came two years after that. Uh, the boys literally became my life and my reason for living. And even though they were such little blessings along the way, nothing had really changed between Denny and I. We had our ups and downs, but mostly downs. Um, we worked hard to look good to those around us. I don't know why, but we did. But we were um, constantly uh, uh, devouring one another, and I was done pretending. I came to this day, I'll never forget it. I could not stand the sound of Denny's footsteps coming in the door after work, so I would have to get high so I could even stand to be around him. Um, in fact, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even look at him for days or weeks on end. Uh, one time I accidentally looked his way and he had grown a beard <laughs> and I didn't know it. We lived under the same roof. Um, but probably the most pivotal moment in our relationship before Christ and definitely the hardest for me to think about and to talk about is uh, I asked Denny one night to take um, the boys downstairs so we could talk and he thought I was going to ask for a divorce. And but when he came back upstairs, I said, I know you probably think that I'm going to ask for a divorce, but I won't because I don't believe in divorce. But if you want a divorce, I will gladly sign the papers like yesterday because you make me sick. Hmm. And for the next 10 minutes, uh, I had many choice words for Denny. And I told him uh, that I hated him more than anyone in the world and that I prayed daily that he would die in a car accident. I would do anything so I could get out of this marriage. When I finished my rant, my little selfish rant, I said, I will expect nothing from you, and you can expect nothing from me. And I walked away satisfied with what I had set out to do, which was to crush him. And I felt really good about that. That's how evil my heart and how hard-hearted I was. Denny was speechless. He turned white. He said nothing. I was so angry, and I'd become so bitter. It had been like uh, maybe 10 years by this time, and neither of us knew what to do. But Denny especially did not know what to do. He prayed a lot and got no answers. And the more he tried to be a good husband, the more I rebelled. Our marriage was empty, and it was void of love, and it was void of any hope at all. Believe it or not, during this time, I had, I had been in the hospital and was watching adoptions on the TV, and so we decided to adopt. We thought, this might be what we need, you know? So we adopted our daughter, McKenna, and she was a sweet diversion at that time. We had hoped, we really had hoped that this would make things better for us, but it didn't. There was excitement at first, as with anything, but there was still just very little conversation between us. We wanted things better, we talked about it, but we had no idea how to get there. One day, Denny decided maybe we should move again and see if that would work. And so he asked me if I wanted to move to Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls was like our dream city. We always wanted to live in Sioux Falls. And so Denny asked his boss for a transfer and he got it. So we moved and we uh, found our dream home and we have our three little boys and a baby girl. And what more could you want? Um, and it didn't do anything. I remember just one day shortly after we moved, I walked into the family room, and I looked outside, and I literally felt this just thick blanket of darkness on me, and I, I couldn't figure out 
what is wrong with me? Like, why can't I be happy? Why can't we be happy? Like, what do I need? And I was so scared at that point because I knew that we had come to the end of the things that we thought would rescue us. But little did we know at that time that only Jesus can rescue anyone out of darkness. I was so angry at everyone. I was angry at everything. I hadn't really talked to my parents much. Um, it was the lowest of lows for me. I'd driven several of my friends away. I hadn't talked to my little sister in three years. I don't even think I looked at her in three years um, because of a conversation that didn't go my way. I had a heart filled with hatred and anger, and I was exhausted. And I tried to figure out what to do, so I decided, you know, I'm going to go visit my sisters in California and hang out with them for a while and drive them nuts. Um, and maybe 1,700 miles away from Denny is just what I need. So I told Denny I was going, and he wasn't happy about that, but I didn't care. I mean, what's he going to do, tell me not to go? I mean, that's funny. Um, so one of my sisters I was going to visit had been a Christian for about 11 years. Lori had been praying for us. And I had confided with her over the years about our marriage because I figured she's far enough away. She's not going to tell anybody. And I knew she'd pray for us because that's all she ever did. And she really was the only one who knew what was going on. And over the years, and I talked to her, she tried to tell me about her relationship with Christ. I didn't understand it. I just thought she was weird and way too happy, like nobody can be that happy. Um, when I told Lori I wanted to come out, she asked me why I was coming, and I told her, I don't know why, but I don't want to come back the same person. And those words might sound spiritual, but that's not what I meant. I meant I want to run away from my problems, which was Denny, and I just want to hang out with you and Carrie and just have fun. That's what we'll do, and that's going to help me a lot. But God had other plans. So right after we got off the phone, Lori decided to look around for a Christian conference to take me to. She wanted me to hear the gospel. Denny took me to the airport with our four kids in tow. And when Denny started to get out, I said loud enough for everyone around to hear, don't get out of that car. I don't need your help. And just so you know, you'll be lucky if I get back, if I come back. And I walked in the airport doors, and I literally just shook in disgust. Like, I could not wait to get away from him. The day I got to Lori's house, she told me we were going out on Friday night, and I was so excited. And then she told me the bad news. <laughs> We're going to church. What? I said, why? Why would we go to church on a Friday night? And she goes, you just wait. You'll see. So when we got there, I remember the doors open. I remember seeing a lot of people in church, and I was really taken back by that. And I said to Lori, um, why are there so many people here on a Friday night? She goes, because they love it here. And I'm like, really? Like, I didn't know anybody ever loved church. Um, so we walk in, and... I, I told Lori that I really wanted to go out that night. She said, if you still want to go out after this, we'll go out. And I said, okay. I was still mad at her, though, for taking me to church. So we, we got in there. We listened to the conference. It was all about revelation and Jesus returning for his people. And um, she knew I loved to hear that about prophecy. And I'm still sitting there just as hard-hearted as can be. And the pastor then gives a gospel uh, call, and he's... Uh, sharing about Jesus dying on the cross and becoming a believer. And if anybody would like to come down and, and give your life to Christ, and so, I don't know, maybe 30 or so people went down. I was kind of <clears throat> surprised by that. And I said to Lori, what, what are those people doing? And she said, well, they're going down to give their life to Christ or and ask for forgiveness and become a Christian. I go, oh, that's, that's not me. I'm a Christian. You know, I don't need to go down there. And the pastor started praying, and then he stopped, and he said, I... I think there's another person in this room that needs to come down here, and I'm not going to pray until they come. And my heart just started pounding, and I said to Lori, I think that's me. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I think I, think I need to go down there, but I'm scared. She goes, well, I'll go with you. And I got up and ran. I don't even know if Lori ever did follow me down there, but I was bawling. I was crying and asking the Lord to forgive me for being a sinner, and I repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I... I, I know I've heard people say this before. I felt the weight of my sin, but I did feel the weight of my sin just gone. And on the way up the aisle to go back uh, down, I, I looked at Lori and I said, I can't wait to see Denny. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, I'm just, I don't know what it is. I just can't wait to see him. And then I looked at her, I said, is anybody in our family a Christian? 
And so Lori said she knew just like something had really uh, drastically changed. We went home and we were nose to nose. Lori was telling me all about Revelation. I think we were at chapter three when Denny called. <laughs> and it, when he called, I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, what do you think I'm doing? I mean, we could, I could hear the kids in the background screaming. They were out of control. And he goes, what do you think I'm doing? I'm here with the kids while you're there partying with your sisters. And I said, that would have normally been World War III. But I said, why don't you put the kids to bed and then call me back? And he's kind of like, quiet. There's like nothing there. And I think he says that it was the fastest put the kids to bed night <laughs> ever. <laughs> and and, and I, uh, he called Brett back pretty quickly. Uh, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just talking to Lori. And because Lori's like, don't say anything. You know, you're going to freak him out. <laughs> And uh, I said, I'm just talking to Lori, and I said, I'll be back tomorrow at 2, and I can't wait to see you. And he's like, okay. And um, so anyway, I remember, I remember getting on the plane and thinking, I wonder if anybody on this plane knows Jesus. And I talked to the guy across the aisle. Nobody seemed to understand what I was talking about. And then I got a little bit scared because I was so excited to see Denny, and I was thinking, what if I don't feel that way when I see him? I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit nervous at this point, but... Anyway, I, uh, that wasn't the case, so I'll let, I'll let Denny take him. Here, here comes part three. <laughs> so uh, the kids and I uh, went to the airport, and this was uh, at, at a time that you could get into the boarding area and watch people come in off the plane. And uh, so we watched Barb come up the, uh, the ramp, and the first thing that I noticed is that she wouldn't take her eyes off of me, and I hadn't seen her look at me maybe that way ever. And uh, so uh, we, were, we were there we, uh, waiting to get the luggage and this type of thing. And I just noticed that, boy, her voice was uh, soft. And uh, she just was not that uh, same uh, boisterous type person. She was gentle. She was patient. And uh, even uh, Matt, our oldest, said, Mom, what happened to you? <laughs> so. I didn't know yet, but uh, I really wanted to find out. <laughs> so we went home, we put the kids to bed, and uh, second so, fastest second fastest time, yeah. And uh, so I said, Barb, I gotta know, what, what happened to you? And she says, well, uh, I confessed to the Lord my sins, and uh, I asked him to be my Lord and Savior. <clears throat> so I said, oh, I have got to have what you have. What do I need to do? So she just said, well, let's go to our knees and pray and just confess your sins and ask him to take over your life. And that's what we did. And that night, uh, I was transferred out of the domain of darkness and uh, transferred into his, the kingdom of his beloved son. It was amazing. And uh, for the first time, in a lot of years, I had hope for Barb and I's future. And uh, we, we were brand new Christians. We really didn't know what we were doing, but we wanted to please him in every aspect of what we were doing. And uh, within a few months, we left the Catholic Church. We pulled our kids out of Catholic school. We began attending a small little church down the street. They had a co-op homeschool. And... Uh, so we proceeded to, uh, to grow in the Lord. And at one point in time, we put together a, uh, it was a multiple page uh, pamphlet. It was called the front page, and we used it to uh, witness to all of our friends. And we sent out about 400 copies uh, to our friends. And uh, we got a little bit of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> we had some tell us, don't ever send me another one of those newsletters again. So, Smed, that's, that is our story of how God revealed himself to us. We praise God for his grace, and thank you for sharing. And uh, it's interesting to, to have such a, a stark contrast so quickly. Yeah. Uh, not everybody experiences the uh, absolute all or nothing from one page to the other, but that doesn't mean that you had all the equipment that you needed um, installed for the Christian life quite yet. And, and you came to biblical principles for parenting later in your Christian life. Uh, we'd love to hear that story. And I want to tell you why I want to kind of tee you up for this question 
um, none of us who are parents or have been parents have done it right all the way. And, and there is much regret as, as we tell us how you came to biblical principles. Well, our kids were, uh, ages four, six, eight, and 10. So we didn't get started real early. Um, and then, uh, Abby came along, uh, uh, about five years later. And, uh, uh, so there, um, there is always hope no matter what stage of parenting that you're in. And, uh, so, uh, I'll just share a little bit and give it over to Barb again. And, and, uh, um, we didn't think our kids were out of control, but we were wrong. And, uh, <laughs> We, we had no idea what we were doing. We, we admit we knew nothing uh, about parenting. And uh, we had rules, consequences, uh, but we didn't enforce them. And uh, Barb and I were in a Bible study at uh, Redeemer Church uh, when her Bible teacher asked her, uh, Barb, would you be interested in uh, attending a, a biblical parenting seminar? And uh, I'll let her tell you about our response. Well, I, it was a Ted trip, Shepherding Your Child's Heart. I didn't know who Ted Tripp was, uh, or even the book, knew nothing. And I'm like, no, I don't, I, I think we're good, you know. And I was homeschooling the kids, and so they were in the child care when I was at Bible study. So I'm pretty sure they were talking back and forth about our kids, because they were climbing the walls. And the next day, or the day, couple days later, I had another gal ask me if I wanted to go to that parenting seminar, it's, you know, Ted Tripp's going to be at Redeemer. No, I think I'm good. And uh, by the end of the week, at least six people asked me, and my Bible teacher came back, and seriously, she was so serious, she said, hey, Barb, how about if I buy you and Denny the book, and I buy your tickets, and you can go to breakfast with me and my husband and Ted Tripp? And I thought, going to breakfast sounded like fun. Let's do that. <laughs> I thought if you throw in a limo ride, we're in. <laughs> so no, you're so bad. Uh, but anyway, so I, I told her, yeah, I, I think that, that sounds really good. So she gave us the book. We read the book. Not sure we really quite understood it, um, a lot of it, because we were just really babies. Um, and um, we went Friday night and listened for a couple hours, and then Saturday morning, our lives changed. Um, sitting there next to Ted Tripp, and asking him question after question after question about parenting. And he couldn't eat his breakfast because he had to keep answering my questions. And only I said, you get, what if you have two kids, they're fighting over a toy, and I really thought I was gonna stump him. And he said, he brought up the rod and reproof several times, and I don't think I was really understanding. And I said, I said oh, I, I would never do that. I would never spank my kids. And he said, really? And I said, no. And he goes, well, then your issue is not with your kids, it's with God. And that was like a dagger to my heart. And I, because I loved the Lord and there was nothing that was going to get in the way of me and my God. And so I looked at Denny and I think Ted got to eat after that because I was speechless. <laughs> um, so we, we went to the conference and I was all in. Denny was all in. We, we knew that... Um, this was going to be a changing day in our lives. And so we listened, we grasped most of it, but like Smed says, we didn't grasp at all. But we came home and with just, we were so excited. And I think we had been to parenting things before, which is probably why we didn't think we should go to this one. Because our kids were like, you know, we said, hey, kids, come out in the kitchen, we wanna talk to you about the parenting uh, seminar we went to. And they're like rolling their eyes. And I'm like, that'd be a spanking. But, um, <laughs> They, they really were like, what? What are you going to tell us? You know, we literally had, I think, 80 to 90 consequences on the fridge. We, we couldn't keep them all. We never did. We were so inconsistent. Um, and the kids were really not happy to um, have to be pulled away from their TV show to come and talk to mom and dad. And so the first thing we did, we said, please forgive us. Please forgive us for the, what our home is. And we had no idea that God has a lot to say about parenting. And so today is going to be a different day, and we're going to t sit you guys down and talk to us. So we had our roundtable discussion with our kids and talked to them about 
Ted Tripp had mentioned that if you have older children and, um, and, and you've never used the rod, you should uh, give them seven days, seven days of training. The training is going to be really important. So that's what we told the kids. We're going to do seven days of training. And the first day, second day, third day, we just could not believe how many times I said, that would be a discipline, that would be a discipline, that would be a discipline. Like, but we had no idea there was that much sin going on in our house. And by day eight, which we called D-Day, um, <laughs> we said tomorrow's gonna be uh, a new day. And we, we just based it on these six things. We said, if, if you're disobedient, if you're defiant, if you're disrespectful, if you're dishonest, if you're distracted, or if you're discontent. And pretty much every sin we found fell underneath those six Ds. And so that's what we started with. On Monday morning before 8.15, uh, Kenna was in the room. By 9, Kenna was in the room. <laughs> it was just a long day. Kenna and Mickey were four and six at the time, and they were really hard. They were the pace setters. Yeah. The older two just watched. And, and listen. They learned very quickly yeah. that they did not want to go into the discipline. Room. Yeah, they did. And, and that, so that it, seven days was yeah. actually uh, very important to us because Barb and I were actually being trained ourselves. And uh, when something had happened, we would get together and, and say, okay, we think that crossed the line. Yes, okay. And so, uh, what's our next step? And so, we, we came together on most everything yeah. that. Uh, uh, that we needed to address in that week. So it was a very important period of time for us. Yeah, we, one of the things that Ted Tripp had in his book, he said, when you teach your children to obey, you teach them self-control. You teach them how to repress their depravity, how to win the victory over their sinful impl impulses. You teach them by making the consequences severe enough that they will not do it. And there was uh, several other, um, um, I think, quotes that really helped Denny and I stay on task. We were so excited to go from 80 or so consequences for our kids down to two. We just, the rod and the reproof, it was so simple. And, I, and even for our kids, it, as much as they did not uh, enjoy the discipline, they enjoyed um, our home. It became peaceful. It wasn't perfect, but it was peaceful. We just, we, we knew what to do. We, we were... Uh, in charge, as it is in chapter four, I think, than Ch Ted Tripp's book. But one of the things that um, uh, in Proverbs thirteen twenty four, this scripture was really impactful to Denny and I. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. John MacArthur says, one who has genuine affection for his child but withholds corporal punishment will produce the same kind of child as a parent who hates his offspring. And then Bruce Ray, another one that was just so um, uh, big for us. It, it hurts to hear your child cry when you discipline them and know that you are the cause of that pain, but it hurts even more to realize that if they don't cry now, they may weep eternally and bitterly in the pain and anguish of hell. So it's better a little crying now than weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for eternity. So that, those are the kinds of things we read. We read a lot of parenting books at that time. And here's the good news, or more good news, is that the discipline uh, room was a chance for us to share the gospel. You know, how, how, Dad, how can I stop sinning like this? Well, there's only one way, and that's Jesus. Let him take control. And so it was a way. I mean, we shared the gospel many times uh, with, our, with our kids. And uh, then there was a period in there that we would pray together and restore. So for before we left the, the discipline room, we would restore with each other. Everything was left in the discipline room. We didn't walk out angry. We didn't walk out, uh, you know, that where we still was going to hold this over their heads. We were restored. And uh, a lot of things that parents uh, uh, forget to do is training in righteousness. So we used this time to maybe go back and role play or what, what should you have done in that situation? Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that they would get pretty bored with that, but they actually liked they it. They liked so. it, yeah. That's our training, or our uh, biblical parenting story. What's interesting is you describe that. You're trying to help your kids have self-control, but you had to model it in the discipline. I'd love to hear what internal dispositions 
what emotions you were feeling or tempted by when it's time to discipline, and then what you did instead. What, 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 what emotions governed even the, the way you did discipline? You want to we, go first? Well, yeah, we find, found right away that the more consistent we were, the anger was gone. We felt this empathy and compassion for our kids because they would, you know, uh, be disciplined. And there were times when we were not um, going into the discipline room without anger. And so I would say to my kids, I would say, you know, moms, I feel angry and I should not be angry. This is a sin. And so I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord to forgive me for my anger. And I would pray until I wasn't anymore, until my heart was softened. And, uh, and then I would ask them for forgiveness. Uh, and then, is that what you mean? Like, and then just began. Um, it, it was so helpful. And a lot of times we would pray before we would even talk about what happened. Why are we in the room? We would pray first talk about why we're in the room. And each kid, each of our kids were different. Um, some were more fearful, really fearful of the rod than others. And, um, but yeah, we would just kind of work through that with um, prayer. And we say all the time, I love you so much. I love you so much. And I don't, I can't have you live like this. So. And for me, uh, I think it was Ted Tripp that indicated that uh, as the, the man in the home, you are to be the leader and you are to uh, make sure or manage this situation. And so that moved me off of the back burner to the front burner and uh, that I was, I was responsible. Um, I was in charge uh, next to God. And so I, I wanted to please God. And so that just what, that's just what kept us going is that we wanted to please him. And boy, it was almost immediately that we saw results. Sibling rivalry dropped uh, significantly. And we, th there was all of a sudden from an out of control place, we were in control. There was peace in our family. So it was noticeable right away. And what are the consequences, what are the effects in a child's life if you are inconsistent or if you discipline out of anger or you discipline for your own convenience? I'm not sure I got the question. Oh, what happens if you, well, go ahead, Smith. If you're inconsistent? Yeah, so you just, you talked about the importance of being consistent and having self-control and being governed by compassion. What are the effects if you do it wrong? If your discipline is inconsistent, if you discipline your kids out of anger, or you discipline your kids because you want your life to go better and they just need to shape up so my life's more convenient. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll answer that with a, a quote uh, by Ted Tripp again, Discipline, disobedience coupled with failure to discipline sends mixed messages. The win of spanking is so simple that parents miss it. If your child is not obeyed, he needs to be spanked. If he's failed to respond to your direction, he's moved out of the circle of safety. It often seems to parents that such exactness regarding obedience is asking too much of them and their children. The truth is, if parents are consistent, they'll find quickly that the child responds and the necessity for discipline decreases. What happens if we are not consistent, and that happens a lot. It's all, that's always going to be an issue, and it's one of the hardest things um, to be consistent and to enforce the rules and to do that is that you just end up in, a, in an environment where um, there is chaos. And partly the reason why we are inconsistent is because we're lazy. Um, and we need to be uh, consistent in our discipline. Well, first of all, we didn't do lots of things correctly, but uh, God blessed our efforts anyway. Mm. So please don't get the idea that we went through this process perfectly. Everything worked really well. Um, a, a situation that came up and uh, I confronted Sam on some sin and he said, well, you didn't discipline Matt yesterday and he did the very same thing. <laughs> I said, Sam, Please forgive me. Uh, I did not discipline Matt yesterday, but I should have. But I'm still going to discipline you today. 
And so <laughs> we, we proceeded to do that. But uh, inconsistency, uh, I mean, how would you like to live in a home that you never knew what was going to happen next? Yeah. And, and consistency allowed us to, to show them that we were going to be, you, you know what we were going to do. And uh, so it just, they, there, were, there were virtually no surprises. And uh, um, when we were inconsistent or we found ourselves kind of, you know, uh, not being consistent, we would s literally sit our kids down for a round table. We did that quite often. We'd sit down and kind of go over the rules again and ask for their forgiveness again. And we're going to start over. And yeah. That's why we're going to have this round table here more after this equipping hour. <laughs> We're not going to get through all the questions that I have for you. Um, and, and you were hoping that I would only ask you the questions that were on the piece of paper that I gave you. I am totally inconsistent, unpredictable. <laughs> That's why we were nervous. <laughs> A biblical perspective on physical discipline goes against the grain of our culture. And, and part of that is the caricature or the anger by which a generation was perhaps receiving physical discipline from parents, um, that a dad would take off his belt or go get a switch from the, the, uh, the, the spring branches off a tree um, and, and beat a kid, not out of love, but out of, I've got to be tough with you uh, and you need to do things my way without a love for the glory of God, w without a, an overwhelming compassion, the kinds of things that you described that, um, that really give physical discipline out of love a bad name. Given all of that, uh, given that uh, we may find ourselves in, in, a, in an era where it becomes illegal in the United States, it's illegal in other Western civilized countries. Um, and so parents can find themselves going against the grain of culture, uh, maybe having to, to deal conscientiously with the law. Um, there was a question in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. This is tough. Um, we have to be grounded in God's word and have confidence, but we also need to have the kinds of things that you described that, that don't give obedience to God's word a bad name. So maybe could you talk us through uh, scenarios and situations um, where you're exercising discretion or caution? How do you help parents, younger parents particularly, for whom the culture is different now than it was a decade ago, sort of navigate this tension? Does that question make sense? I think so. Uh, we, in this chart that Barb described earlier, the, the deadly, six deadly Ds, um, if you were inside the circle, you were safe. If you were outside the circle, you were, there was going to be a consequence. And so the... Um, okay, s slow down on that. It, it took me five times to understand you, over the phone. Inside the circle, outside of the circle, what do you mean by that? <laughs> so just slow down for... for okay, uh, we had a circle. The deadly D's were outside the circle, so when there was disobedience, disrespect, whatever, that was outside the circle. If you were inside the circle, you were practicing the fruit of the Spirit, so to speak. You were kind, you were gentle, um, respectful, that type of thing. So that's the, uh, that's the circle of obedience. And, and they, they understood that, uh, and uh, the older they got, then we did use discretion, but we had to have a consequence, and that consequence had to be painful. I, I, are you asking about discretion when you're out in public? Sure, yeah, you're in the grocery store and yeah, a kid's yeah. outside the circle. Yeah. Deadly D's all over aisle seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, they definitely need to um, be discreet and to be careful when they're out in public, and so, I've had many, many questions like that from young moms who are at Target and their cart is full and their kid is going crazy because he wants that toy that you told him he couldn't have. And there's just different ways. I mean, you can, uh, I, I mean, in, in, if it were me, I would tell them that I would just ask the lady if I could just keep my cart here and we'll be right back. We had a situation with um, um, Abby who when she was in school, and she was being, she was so distracted in school, and you obviously can't go to school and 
and, and spank your child. But the teacher uh, was a believer, and I asked her if she would at least let me know when she was like that, if I could just know that. Uh, I'd come and take care of that, and she did. She, and I, took, I went in and got Abby out of class, brought her back out. We were kind of fortunate because we had a van with curtains. <laughs> it was really nice. So, uh, I, Electric curtains. <laughs> no, but it was really, it, it, it was, uh, I took her away from the classroom, and we you know, just had our little discipline session. And if, you know, take them to the car and love on them and discipline them and go back into Target. It, it, it works. It really does. And, and if your kids know ahead of time before you get there what is expected of them, um, hopefully you're doing that training and discipline at home that you don't really have to deal with that out in public, but you do from time to time. That just happens. So you'd be very careful. Careful. Yeah, the training beforehand, uh, we used to have little coaching sessions before we'd go into a store. This is what you can do and this is what you can't do. And... You know, if you can't do it and you do it, there'll be a consequence. And uh, we did it in a loving way, and they responded very well. So we prepared them for different situations. I'm really curious about the 50 to 80 things on the fridge. What, what were some of those? Oh, you know, it was like, you know, if you do this, then this is your consequence. You're going to have to go to your room for the night, or you're going to have to... You know, you're gonna have to go, you know, pull weeds or it, we, we had, yeah, no TV or take away Xbox. It was just, it was, there were a lot and there were so many. And in fact, that's exasperation and it, exasper it really did. They, uh, they knew, they knew that we would never um, do what we said we were gonna do. So when you say that's exasperation, we're, we're talking about the principle, do not exasperate your yeah. children. You're yeah. talking about as a parent, having those 50 to 80 consequences oh. you can't keep track of. Yeah. They don't know what's coming, when it's gonna be enforced. Yeah. Some of those consequences they might have even liked. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it just makes an impossible situation to know where's the circle, what's expected. Yeah. And kids love boundaries. I mean, they, they wouldn't say they love boundaries, but they really do love boundaries because they know what's expected of them. And that was probably the most freeing thing for Denny and I. We literally were in bondage, and we had no idea. I had friends and family tell me, I am never going with you anywhere if you bring your kids. <laughs> never. And uh, w my mom called us the Pagel Hurricane when we came into the house. So it, it was, I can't even tell you what that did for us. And I remember halfway through the week after we were using the rod, I called Ted Tripp on the phone and I said, I, I think I'm going to kill my daughter. Like, I, we're in that room constantly and I, I, I can't do this anymore. And he's like, hang in there for seven days. I don't know why he said seven days. I don't know what it was all about that. But I did that. And on the seventh night when I was putting Kenna to bed, she said, Mom, I didn't get spanked today. It was just such a great day. And I'm like, oh, that's so great, honey. I, I was probably so busy with the others I didn't even notice. But uh, it, it was really sweet. It was really sweet for God to do that. Now, we're going to make sure we send the link of this to all five of your children. <laughs> yeah, they know already. I already told them. My we're five be are sitting here, <laughs> so I'm not going to name any names like you've done. Oh. <laughs> but you called Ted Tripp. Yeah. And we're at the dining room table, and the presenting issue is probably broccoli. <laughs> but the real issue is a stubborn heart, and yeah. you know who you are. <laughs> 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 and we called you. And just as an evidence of God's grace, there's a book, there's a seminar, there's six people that said, hey, you need to come to this, come to breakfast. There's that moment where God was kind to you yeah. and produced a U-turn. Yeah. Um, and then in God's kindness, you were a help to us in a time of need. Um, I'd love for you to, to speak to parents who are wondering, is a U-turn possible? Is there hope? What would you say? There's always hope. There's always hope. <clears throat> I think uh, Proverbs 19:18 says, "Discipline your son while there is hope, and do not desire his death." There's always hope as long as they're under your roof, um, and and even if they're <clears throat> beyond, you know, the rod age, and um, there is a time when that you have to retire that. Um, it one of the things that happened with Denny and I, and really with McKenna, and she knows I'm telling this story, but she was 18. And she was not saved at the time, um, but I remember telling her I really needed to use her 
car. And one of the things that Denny and I had figured out is that Kenna was so quick to say, please forgive me. You know, Kenna, don't do that. Oh, please forgive me. And she was very, very quick um, to do that. So we kind of just, okay, we forgive you and we move on without a consequence. And then without a consequence, it just seemed like it just continued to go like that. And so one, we sat her down, round table, and said, we've noticed that there's just a need for more discipline and correction, so we're going to do that. We're going to have more uh, discipline every time you sin or use your whatever happens. And so we did that. And from that moment on, it was like a such a huge change. We just brought about a consequence, whether it was, you know, taking her Facebook. She had Facebook friends, uh, phone. her phone, and I don't know, and her car. Yeah, those were the kind of the four things. And um, but we never did it with like, we're taking your car away from you, or you're not going to be on Facebook for a month. It wasn't like that. We, again, like Denny said, we we shared the gospel with her and told her that we loved her and that we just couldn't let her just continue on and so just things like that when the kids were older like that we had just to get more creative but it's possible and it it, it is uh really about the parent almost more than the child because it's all about your attitude towards your children do you have a relationship with your child do you love that child? And you, you just want them to be set free. You want God to take the scales off their eyes. And so it's just uh, we, we parent them with love, not with um, exasperation, you know. We get back to the, uh, we use the round table quite often. And uh, for our older kids, that was very important because we just described what was happening and we said that, uh, We've got to honor God in this, and so there's going to be a consequence. And so our consequence was not something that was out of the spur of the moment. We were so angry, we we're going to do this or whatever. So we had those all planned out, and they knew what was going to happen if if they crossed the line. And so that roundtable became a very uh, important part of of our parenting, especially for the older older kids. Thank you both so much. Uh, we are going to do part two. Uh, a number of weeks out, because there are other questions we want to ask you. Um, but the book table has parenting resources. Uh, there are equipping hours that we have done on parenting various ages of kids uh, that you can uh, look up on the church website. There are more of those to come, and uh, you can schedule a round table in, in Denny and Barb's dining room, right? They can call you up and say, hey, when can we get a round table? Um, and then, uh, Denny, I would love for you just to close us in prayer, uh, pray for the parents and the grandparents that are carrying these loads. Father, we do thank you for your gift of grace. Thank you for interceding into our lives that in ways that we had no way of knowing what to do next. And you are faithful, you are trustworthy, and we just, uh, we, we love you. And uh, we wanna be obedient to you and we want you to uh, know that uh, we want to honor you in every way that we can. So we, we know that you are a God who cares well for his kids, and you want more good things for us than we could ever imagine. And so we thank you. Thank you again for interceding and allowing us to see your grace in all of these situations. It's in your name we pray. Amen.